Yes. Uh, okay. Any uh, questions about final project stuff or the quiz or uh, the virtual machine stuff? I guess reminder, quiz due 9 p.m. tonight. Put that in my calendar. It's on gray scope. <laughs> All right, so today is going to be a, a little kind of change of pace as far as topic goes. We're not talking about some operating system feature per se. We're talking about the fact that aspects of the operating system which we have viewed as completely essential um, are in fact uh, deeply vulnerable to, um, to compromise. And uh, we're going to talk about a particular vulnerability called Meltdown. So named because it uh, effectively melted the isolation barriers between uh, kernel and user memory. Um, and uh, there's a, a, a paper by, uh, authored by people who had at least publicly discovered Meltdown, who knows, uh, uh, hackers may have discovered it decades ago, no way to know for sure. Um, but something they say in their abstract is that this completely eliminates all memory isolation provided by the operating system. Uh, and there's, as we'll see, there's some assumptions uh, in that statement about the kinds of systems that are vulnerable. Um, but this was a huge deal, got a lot of attention when it was um, publicized in, in 2018. And because security and has been a sort of running theme throughout this course, uh, and our main strategy has been isolation, things like user and kernel mode, um, page tables, system calls that check user input, uh, it's worth looking at examples of how things can go wrong and the way in which they do. Um, so this meltdown attack was sort of this really surprising breakdown of user kernel isolation. Um, and as we'll see, it exploited hidden features of uh, Intel CPUs. So not only was this a surprising and, and um, kind of catastrophic vulnerability, but it depended on undocumented behavior of Intel CPUs. So there was Basically, uh, and a lot of the stuff I'm going to say today um, is based on uh, a lot of different people's guesswork about what the Intel CPUs do. Um, as a CPU manufacturer, you don't want to publish down to the last wire the spec of all your technology because then your competitors just you know get all your secrets. So it's a lot of like, this is what people think the Intel CPUs probably do that would explain this behavior. Uh, and this one turned out to be fixable. Uh, meltdown is, uh, this particular vulnerability is not one that people are, are worried about, but it does, um, people do fear a sort of endless supply of this kind of attack. Um, so it's very, very much, very much alive. So let's, let's start with um, a bit of code to, to get into this. And, and the code I'm going to use for this is going to be this sort of mix between C and assembly. It's going to use C-like syntax to just be easier to read, but it's going to be interacting with registers. And so you'll see. So we have a large buffer. And we have some register that is um, A, uh, actually, here we go. We have a kernel virtual address um, in some register, and then we go about reading the memory at that virtual address. Now this is code that is running in a user process. Like this, this attack depends on no uh, privileged access to anything about the system. So we're just running this 
as, as an ordinary user process. We read some, we, we at least try to read some kernel memory. We kind of isolate the least significant bit of whatever we read from kernel memory. We multiply it by, uh, say, uh, the size of a page, uh, and then we use that as an index into our kind of into our own our own memory. So this will be executed as user code, um, and the key question is: Will R two end up holding data from the kernel's memory. Um, this um, this also depends on kind of having a kernel kernel virtual address in this case. Um, and maybe we just can make a good guess uh, or we know like where the kernel has some data or some secret like a password or, or whatever it is that we're interested in. Uh, Maybe we're just trying many, many possible addresses. Maybe we've carefully studied the implementation of the kernel we're attacking to get a better idea of where in virtual memory we might want to attack. But uh, one thing that Meltdown is going to rely on uh, is something that was true of um, certainly Linux and, and other operating systems at, at the time, uh, which was uh, that the kernel, it, it assumes that the kernel is mapped in the user page table. And so what I mean by that is we have physical memory, and then if we have uh, our uh, virtual memory, there's some kind of range of that virtual memory that is kind of the user mappings. These are virtual addresses that the user is allowed to access. Uh, and so maybe we can get to kind of some physical memory using an entry in the user page tables. Uh, but the user's page table also includes all the mappings um, from the kernel uh, and in fact, the kernel mappings will encompass all of physical memory. Right? The, the kernel has page table entries for all pages in physical memory because it wants to be able to access every single uh, place in physical memory. Um, and there's uh, a bit of our page table entry that says the user can access, like the user can access this page table entry, or it's only for the kernel. So all of these kernel ones have this bit set to zero. The user can't access them. Uh, so this is something that, that a bunch of operating systems were, were doing, or something like this. Uh, what would anyone have an idea of what and why operating systems were doing this? Why were we putting the kernel mappings uh, in the user page table? Is it just to guess could it be like for faster access? Yes. Uh, so specifically, think about what needs to happen when we do a system call. Oh. Well, now it's like partial field memory because like the previously users, if you split them up, the user pages aren't valid for kernel mode, so you have to ignore them and still log. But this way, user pages still are valid in kernel mode, so you can just leave it. Exactly. When we switch to kernel mode using the strategy, we don't have to switch page tables. We can just keep using the same page table. We get better TLB <coughs> performance. Um, and so the sort of, kind of sub theme to all the sort of uh, contingent factors that led up to this vulnerability is the peril of performance. I don't know if that's how you spell peril. But there were all these decisions that were, were made that were like, this seems fine. 
and it's going to give us better performance, so let's do it. Um, things were not fine in the end. All right, so we have kernel and, and user here. Um, and uh, the point of this is that uh, whether like this at this, vir this kernel virtual address that we're, we're reading, it is a valid address. Uh, there is actually like meaningful data there. It's just forbidden. Like the user process shouldn't be able to read it. But there is actual actual stuff there. So that's one part of the picture. Another part of the picture. Um, is this technique called speculative execution. And this is the way in which this code, which seems like it should try and read forbidden memory and just crash. Speculative execution is the way in which running this code actually becomes useful to the attacker. So what is speculative execution? Um, this is the kind of hidden complexity that uh, uh, if you like read the, the manual for the Intel CPU, like the details of, of this spectrum of execution are just not, I mean, there may be a blog post about like, if you want to optimize, here's some vague advice. But like the details of this are not publicly documented. Um, but people have, have figured some things out. So we have, We have some kind of data in register zero. And then register one, we want to uh, we want to read some information about whether this R0 is a valid um, uh, is a valid pointer. So R0 has the address of some data, uh, and then we're going to read some other information from uh, main memory that's going to tell us whether this is a, a valid address or not. Um, and what I'm going through now is not, it's not a security vulnerability. This is like why we would want Spectre that's execution, why it's going to help us, why, why they put it in the, the CPU. Um, so to read something from main memory, uh, how, like, if we're kind of executing, maybe we have a 2 gigahertz CPU, uh, which says we execute 2 billion uh, uh, instructions per second, thereabouts anyway. Um, how long in, in terms of these sort of processor uh, clock cycles, kind of the, where we could be executing instruction, about how long, how many of those would it take uh, for, for us to get this information from main memory? Well, 20. Uh, 20 would be, would be optimistic. Um, Victor? I'd say like a couple million, since it takes about a millisecond to, um, I think, it takes about a millisecond to retrieve something from the RAM. Um, that is very pessimistic. Okay. <laughs> uh, it takes about a, uh, about a hundred nanoseconds, give or take, to get something from from main memory, and it's like half a nanosecond per clock cycle if we're running it at two billion per second. So uh, we have something like uh, two hundred clock cycles, uh, kind of two hundred instructions that we could be executing uh, that we might just have to wait for this information come back. Um, but processors, they're a competitive market. Uh, customers are always wanting better performance. Um, so you, gotta, you, you just can't afford to wait 200. You can't just like sit around and wait for 200 clock cycles while you're waiting for this data. You've got to be doing something that might pay off. Uh, so let's imagine that after uh, what we're doing with this valid is We're saying if 
it is one, then we're going to so if if R0 turned out to be a valid pointer, we'll read it uh, and then you know, do something. Doesn't really matter what with that data, maybe add one to it. Um, and otherwise, we will set R3 to 0. And so what are um, uh, what our CPU is going to do is say, all right, I'm waiting for this uh, slow operation to come back. Uh, and instead of just sitting around and doing nothing, I'm going to speculatively execute instructions further down the line. Um, and, well, it's not clear which instructions I should execute because it depends on this value that I'm waiting for. So, not only will I speculative, speculatively execute some further instructions, I'm going to, the CPU is going to attempt to predict which of these branches the program is going to go down. Um, this might be done uh, by kind of caching previous branches from previous times we ran this program. And assuming it's going to do the same thing uh, when we get to this branch again, um, or there are the kind of other fancy kind of predictive techniques. But there's some part of the CPU whose job it is to like take an educated guess as to which branch we're going to go down. And uh, so maybe we just say, uh, let's speculate that this is going to be valid. And so then we'll kind of read the data from this address, put it in this register, add one to it. And um, this kind of, re kind of executing head, that's speculation. Um, so what if the branch prediction goes wrong? Like, what if, in fact, valid comes back and it's zero? And we've already gone ahead and executed these two instructions. In that case, we have to kind of revert the contents of these two registers. We have to undo the things that we did due to misspeculation. Um, and then it's kind of start executing again at this other branch. Well, Can I ask a only semi-tangential question? All right. So I was reading about, I, I was curious about this the other day, and I was reading like the risk v algorithm for branch prediction. And it seemed to me there was like this really complex algorithm. And it's just like, I just couldn't wrap my head around like how a CPU without a CPU could be like, in parallel executing like such complex computation so quickly, like is the hardware needed to do branch prediction algorithms significant or is it just like is the implementation of it less complex than the, the idea? Um, so this is a, this is a, an interesting point that like what I'm describing that the CPU is doing at a speed of, of sub nanoseconds seems sort of insane um, that it can do all this stuff. Uh, well, it's worth taking a look at what does this, um, uh, like what is, a, what, what is a simplified diagram of, uh, of this part of the CPU look like? Um, this is from the, the paper that's linked as, as reading for today, and they do say this is a simplified diagram. Um, and they are emphasizing that there's this reorder buffer and scheduler that is what is taking in kind of possible instructions that it could execute and deciding like how to execute them out of order. Like if it's waiting for this one, it's going to schedule these ahead. Um, and specifically to the, to the branch prediction, there's a kind of dedicated unit on the CPU which has a bunch of dedicated circuitry just for executing this branch prediction algorithm. So if you, even if you have a really complicated algorithm, uh, you can, if it's something that you're going to be doing a lot, it can be worth it to just like build a circuit to just run that algorithm and stick it on the CPU. I think there's stuff with floating point where of all the, the hyperbole floating point, there's like dedicated uh, circuitry to like just like run those sort of computations. In, um, 
Do you need a variable instead of an actual just like temporal offset here? Like would it would it load up the code and just put in the variable as it goes along? Um do we say when it needs a variable, like what is like not, what is changing about it? Like if we're waiting for a variable instead of Oh, okay. sorry. I guess we're looking at value. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we are. We are in fact just like basically waiting for some variable to like come back from from memory. Okay. Other questions? All right. Okay. Okay. So. Um, Doing this speculative execution is a huge performance benefit because if it turns out that we predict right, we when this data comes back, we have already run potentially hundreds of instructions ahead and just like put that into place. We've already done all that work while we were waiting for this, so um, huge performance benefit. Um, however. Uh, If we kind of run this branch and R0 turns out not to be a valid pointer, it's null or some some bad address, like what, what should happen in sort of normal situation when we try and try and read it, read it? The CPU does a bunch of reversing operation and then after it gets back to where I three R three is supposed to be the runs the other branch. Um, yeah, so th that's the speculative part. I'm asking just like if we weren't doing speculative stuff, we were just like going through this normally, and we try and read a bad address. Like, what does our system do in response? Victor, say troll. Yeah, it raises some exception, right? Like that. If we try and read some bad address, the system should raise some exception. We end up in some handler. Um, kind of the appropriate thing things happen. So. Uh, like if valid was one, but actually R zero was not a valid address, then we should raise an exception. Um, if valid was zero, so uh, like we speculatively executed this, but then it turned out valid was zero, we don't actually want to raise that exception because this wasn't actually supposed to execute after all. So. There's this idea that when we're speculatively executing instructions, um, they're not actually taking effect until we retire the instruction. It's a sort of technical term. So uh, we wouldn't actually uh, put data or raise an exception into the real register R2 uh, until we retire that instruction. And importantly, to retire an instruction, all previous instructions need to have been retired. So that is to say that uh, we're not allowed the CPU isn't allowed to have this instruction sort of affect the system by changing the real R2 or making an exception until all previous instructions have been retired, meaning that this read from memory is actually complete. Um, and so this speculation in principle is invisible to programs. Like CPU execute some instructions ahead, uh, and if it turns out those shouldn't happen, it just sort of throws away those results and, and picks up where, where it should have. Um, and the goal is let's increase performance without changing the behavior of programs. Everything still works the way we expect, but now we get better performance because we're, we're speculating. Um, and so some more kind of jargon about this. If we go to the Intel CPU manual and we read about how it works, and it's like these are the instructions. These are what you do. execute and add. It adds two things together, stores them in a destination register. This is what are called 
architectural features are these kind of formally documented things you find in the manual. Um, the ones that are not in the manual that are intended to be invisible that programmers shouldn't need to know about, like speculative execution, these are micro architectural is the kind of term for these, these hidden features. So that complicated diagram that I, that I put up was a diagram of uh, the micro architecture of a CPU. Kind of, of like what are these kind of, uh, these different pieces doing? So that's the speculative execution part. Uh, there's one other thing that we have to have to care about. Um, talked about it earlier. Um, uh, and that is the role that caches are going to play in this whole process. So uh, let's say we have our CPU uh, and it issues, it's like, I want to load uh, uh, I'm kind of load some address X. Um, thinking about the kind of different caches, different components of our system, what is the first place we look for X? Uh, we even before or before or in parallel with the TLD. Uh, yeah, we have our L1 cache. Uh, what kind of addresses do we use for the L1 cache? Yeah, so our L1 cache has something like uh, uh, a virtual address and uh, the data that we're looking for. Um, and uh, one important thing that I forgot to mention about uh, the speculative execution is that in Intel chips, this memory access, when executed speculatively, did not check the permissions of that memory address. So, if the if the address R zero was something that should that, that should not be allowed to read, it read it into R two anyway. And then, at the time this instruction was retired, that is when the permissions were checked. Um, There's not like, and, and in fact, in the L1 cache, the permissions are sitting right there. Um, but the idea is, you know, the speculative execution is, is going to be invisible. We're going to throw away the results uh, if we don't need them. Um, so we don't need to check permissions on access, only on retirement. And, uh, you know, it would take some number of additional transistors, probably not a lot, probably not enough to, to impact performance much, but it would take a little bit of extra work to check the permission sort of at the moment that we did the speculative read rather than kind of when we retire it. Um, interestingly, AMD, another manufacturer of x86 chips, did not take the same approach. Meltdown never affected those chips because it checked permissions when it did the speculative execution, not when it retired the instruction. This difference, you know, it's hidden. It's it's microarchitecture. It's not documented. Like you, you wouldn't know that this was how these processors behave only by observing like which ones uh, can get owned by meltdown. Um, do you do you know what's going on? Um, so yeah, after L1, we need to go to the TLB. Uh, hopefully, the TLB gives us. You know, a uh, 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 page table entry, which we can get the physical address, and then on to our L2 cache, uh, which has like our physical address and the data that we're looking for. Um, so, uh, in practice, the presence of caches mean that our microarchitecture is not actually invisible to the user. It manifests in the form of performance. That you can tell based on performance, kind of, was something speculatively executed? Was something brought into the cache? So there's kind of these side effects of uh, performance 
that even though the microarchitecture is invisible from the sort of logical behavior of the program, from its performance, how long things take, that, that you can sort of use to get insight into what this microarchitecture is doing. So there is a question that we want to ask, or, or to do Meltdown, the, the, the question we want, to, we want to be able to ask is, is a piece of data in the cache? Knowing this is going to, to, to turn out to let us kind of read memory that we're not supposed to. So how would we actually uh, uh, tell if something was in the cache? Uh, there is a technique called flush and reload, where it goes as follows. Um, our goal is, did some function f use memory address x. And the way that we can find this out is that we we need to ensure first that this memory address x is not in the cache. Um, the uh, x86 uh, instruction set architecture gives us a really convenient uh, CL flush instruction that just says, you know, Make sure this address is not in the cache. Uh, if we didn't have this instruction, uh, anyone have an idea of how we could ensure that X was not in the cache? On a lot of data. Yeah, we, our cache has like 64 slots. We load 64 random things. You know, X is is got has to have been kicked out of the cache. Um, all right, so we ensure X is not in the cache. Uh, then. We need to call our function. Uh, and then we need to record uh, the time. Now, we're dealing with sub nanosecond times here. Is that CPUs are, are executing at, at 2 gigahertz, something like that. Uh, so it might be challenging to accurately measure time at that level. Fortunately, again, Intel CPUs come to the rescue with uh, a instruction RDTSC which will tell us exactly how many clock cycles um, there have been. So this instruction gives us a way to measure time at the sort of level of precision that we care about, exactly how many clock cycles uh, have taken place. To record the time, uh, we load a byte from our address x, uh, and then we record the time again. How could we use these two times? To answer our question, did X or did F access memory address X? Well, step four will be faster if F did use memory address X. Yeah, and when we uh, think about how long it takes to access these these different these different levels. Um, uh, L1 is going to be like a few clock cycles. Uh, L2, um, dozens of clock cycles. Main memory, hundreds of clock cycles. Um, so we can tell if, if the, this difference, if it's very small, it's kind of conclusively we found uh, X in the L1 cache, but it's very large, um, then we definitely did not find X in the cache. So this can, can tell us was X uh, uh, kind of used um, 
in between when we got rid of the cache and, and measured the time. Yeah. What well, makes customer execution methods back up? Because like you do step four, it says, okay, we'll next some RAM. It's gonna take a while. Let's go on to the next instruction, which is in record time again. And like will record time and not like does record time like block speculative instructions or is it um yeah, so so you would Uh, need to use something called a, a, a memory fence uh, at this point to like ensure that the CPU like actually loaded this and didn't go on until it was finished loading. Um, yeah, but it's it, it's true that there's some extra detail here to like make sure that this the, that uh, this works out how we expect. Um, other questions on flush and reload? Well. If you didn't have that um, cycle count instruction, would it still be possible to do it with like timing it lots of times? Uh, possibly. I don't know off the top of my head how um, how close, uh, like what granularity you could get absent this in, this instruction. It might. I expect you can still do it, but it might be a lot more annoying. All right, so we have assembled all the pieces that we need to uh, effect a meltdown attack, um, which means that it is time for me to tell you about Franklin Roosevelt, uh, uh, 32nd president. Um, you, may, you may remember that he uh, came to office uh, uh, giving uh, poor Herbert Hoover the boot. Um, and Roosevelt came in on a message of like, we're in this terrible crisis, government's just going to try stuff. And if it doesn't work, we'll admit it and we'll just try something else. Um, and kind of launched all these programs, uh, uh, pro kind of labor unions, things like the Civilian Conservation Corps and the Works Progress Administration, which were like, let's just make lots of, the government's going to create lots of jobs since uh, millions and millions of people are out of work. Uh, and this program we called the New Deal. Um, uh, one interesting thing about Roosevelt is he followed the same career path as his distant cousin Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt um, was Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Franklin Roosevelt was Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Theodore Roosevelt was Governor of New York. Franklin Roosevelt was Governor of New York. Um, uh, they both ran for Vice President, although Franklin Roosevelt wasn't actually elected Vice President. Um, and uh, this leads to uh, a meme that I enjoy about uh, the New Deal and Solitaire. Um, and uh, also something that's, that's fun about Franklin Roosevelt is that he was just a, a kind of um, squirrely uh, uh, kind of, uh, and, and charismatic campaigner. So I have a couple, uh, couple videos for you. Let me warn you and let me warn the nation. Against the smooth evasion that says, of course we believe these things. We believe in social security. We believe in work for the unemployed. We believe in saving homes. Cross our hearts and hope to die. We believe in all these things. But we do not like the way the present administration is doing that. Just turn them over to us. We will do all of them. We will do more of them. We will do them better. And most important of all, the doing of them will not cost anybody anything. He was uh, ma making fun of his opponents in the, the 1936 campaign. Uh, another memorable moment in that campaign, he was giving a, a speech in Madison Square Garden in New York, um, uh, and he uh, and he says the, the, the following, which is a, a famous line. Now, before, in all our history, have these forces been so united? Against one candidate as they stand today. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. Sorry about um, 
um, big business and, and uh, money managers and the, the line. I welcome their hatred. Is, you know, that, that one went in the history books. Um, and he's also the president who was elected uh, not twice, not three times, but four times in a row, uh, again in 1936, uh, again in 1940, uh, and then in the midst of World War II uh, for a fourth uh, and final time in 1944. Um, uh, he would die sh uh, shortly after being elected in, in 1944. Um, uh, you probably uh, know that he was paralyzed from the waist down um, for most of his adult life due to polio, um, uh, and it was kind of in, in poor health after running the country for 12 years. Um, and so his, his vice president, Harry Truman, would, would take over um, uh, and see the country through the, the end of World War II. All right, that is Franklin Roosevelt. So let's actually mount our meltdown attack. So I'm going to pull up some code here. All right, so here's our kind of full full attack. We have some some buffer, some local memory, um, and uh, we do the flush part of flush and reload. Uh, make sure that kind of neither page of our buffer is in the cache, uh, and then uh, we execute some slow operation like a, a division or fetch from main memory, something that's going to take a while. Uh, and then we have uh, what I started out with, this, um, we have some kernel address, we're going to read it, and as I said, the Intel chip not going, not going to check the permissions on this address uh, when it is doing a speculative execution. Um, and so we read some kernel memory, we get the lowest bit, uh, that lowest bit's going to be one or zero. Uh, and so we're going to have R2 be either 0 or 4096. Uh, and then we're going to um, uh, use that as an index into our buffer, read some, some part of our memory. Um, eventually, when, uh, when we retire this instruction, uh, it's going to cause uh, a page fault. Um, and as a user process, we may have kind of registered our own page fault handler uh, uh, to deal with this. Uh, there are a couple other approaches that are described uh, in, the, in the reading, uh, but we kind of recover or suppress this page fault, uh, and then we do the reload part, where we kind of time how long it takes uh, to read um, the first, something, a byte from the, the first page of our buffer versus the second page. Um, oh, and this is this is actually backwards. This should say uh, a zero. Um, if this first time was much faster than the second time, then this first thing got put into the cache during this speculative execution. Uh, if this second one is a lot faster uh, than uh, it was, then R two was one, uh, and kind of the second page of our buffer got put into the cache. And so at the end of this, we have successfully read uh, one bit of kernel memory. Um, it might not seem very exciting, uh, but we could do this billions of times and read billions of bits from kernel memory. In fact, we could just read all of kernel memory if we wanted to um, using this, this approach. Um, so. We're able to read kernel memory um, just by executing code in a user process, uh, exploiting the fact of speculative, speculative, speculative execution, and the caches are going to expose the decisions the microarchitecture is making by timing how long things take. And so this getting information by timing uh, is what's called a side channel attack. Um, like we're not directly uh, uh, 
Like we're, we're not able to directly access this bit of kernel memory, like the speculative execution is just like, is throwing this result away. But the side channel of timing how long uh, an access to our own memory takes um, is going to end up kind of giving us information about what was in the kernel's memory. So one thing to note is that this attack often doesn't work. Um, and in fact, the conditions necessary for its success are not entirely clear. Um, it seems like uh, if the kernel data is in L1, this usually works, uh, and if not, it's a lot less reliable in terms of seeing a clear difference between the timing um, and being able to be confident about what was this bit one or zero. Um, how could Meltdown be used in a real-world attack? Um, the attacker needs to be able to run code on whatever machine they are, they are targeting. Um, but I could log into Mantis. I can run code on Mantis as a kind of normal uh, user without privileges. Uh, and I could read um, passwords, uh, uh, cryptographic keys, kind of, I could read stuff out of the kernel's memory. Uh, using this uh, this approach, um, the big worry with this was in cloud computing. So remember, we talked about uh, a, a server for cloud computing might be running uh, a virtual machine manager that has like many different customers sharing the same. Like AWS has a server, you buy some time from them, uh, and you're just sharing the machine with uh, ten other ten other customers, um, and then using Meltdown. You're just like happily reading the supposedly secure, isolated data uh, of all these other customers. Um, and the security and isolation that AWS promised everyone uh, is, is meaningless. Um, so that was what got people really freaking out about, about Meltdown. Well, If I'm running code in some container on AWS, how can I like possibly know what addresses to even start looking at in the kernel like on all the other containers and what's useful and what's not? Um, yes, yeah, so, so finding this, this kernel virtual address, uh, when we're dealing with security, uh, we kind of, we should assume that the attacker is kind of, uh, endlessly invested and patient. So the attacker could just try every kernel address, um, and eventually get out the full contents of kernel's memory. Um, you, like, at the same time, you would probably um, be trying to make educated guesses about who you are attacking. Um, so uh, maybe you think, okay, my, the, the thing that I'm buying from AWS is in this particular data center. It's an educated guess that company A is going to be, like, Microsoft or, uh, probably not Microsoft, but Netflix or someone going to have a lot of, um, because of the where this data center is, probably going to be um, have a lot of stuff running in it. Uh, so chances are high that uh, the VMs that are sharing my server are the ones that Netflix uh, is is running. So now I have some idea of like what I'm attacking and what I might want to get out of it. Um, but uh, it's like. This attack doesn't necessarily like require some some special access to the machine, but it might require some persistence to actually like, get something useful out of it. Um, so how how does this get fixed? What can we do about this? Um, so uh, anyone have a uh, so so if we were to do this fix in software, if we were to change something about uh, the operating system kernel um, that this meltdown attack relied on. Uh, anyone have an idea of, of what we could what we could target? Well, you could not include the kernel with the rest of the user memory. Yes, we we could uh, not have the kernel's page table entries just sitting in the user's page table. Um, there's going to be some some performance hit for doing this because we're now going to have to switch page tables on, on system calls. Um, but this was, this was the first round of fixes that were implemented. 
Uh, and if you if you read the paper, uh, they have a footnote saying like we actually told a bunch of like companies about this before publishing this paper. Um, and at the time it was published, like uh, Windows and and um, uh, some versions of Linux and, and Mac had kind of uh, released patches that got rid of this like page to uh, using combining these page tables. Um, uh, and one way that um, you can, like the, the real cost to switching page tables is you get a bunch of, you, you have to get rid of a bunch of stuff in the TLB. Um, but as we talked about, you can actually kind of tag each TLB entry with some process ID. Um, this is actually something that's implemented and you kind of get, you avoid having to flush the whole thing. Um, how about in, in hardware? What, what might we change in, in the hardware about you know, what Intel is doing? In order to to prevent that, then. Um, yes, we can check the permissions at the time when we execute, speculatively execute something. Um, that seems that seems like a good idea. Um, <laughs> that seems like maybe those maybe those like few transistors weren't weren't worth it um, making that decision. And, and recent Intel CPUs have um, this wasn't something that they could do to old Intel CPUs. Um, uh, there were other sort of uh, uh, fixes you could do to, to, to some older ones, but newer ones kind of actually have a, a setting that you can, uh, they, they can either uh, do that check or not, uh, and actually the, like the, uh, like Linux, when it boots up, can find out from the CPU, like what mitigations for these sort of vulnerabilities you have in place, and then Linux can decide, or do I need to separate the user and kernel page tables or not, based on is the CPU going to protect me, or do I, the, the operating system, have to do it? Um, so, Meltdown, it was, it was scary, but this particular vulnerability um, was fixed without kind of too much in the way of, of performance costs. Um, but memory isolation turned out to, to be a fiction, um, at least in this case, which, which, is, which is disturbing. Um, and uh, like this isn't done playing out. They're like they're they're very well. Uh, maybe more of these sort of micro architecture vulnerabilities um, that show up in the future. All right. Any questions on any of this meltdown stuff? Cool. That's all for today. Have a great weekend. Remember to do the quiz. Nobody knows just how it started. Somebody blew it through.